just before we look at Hawk Roost in, in detail, I um, just want to remind you of um, the quite useful smile, which is a, 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 good, a good revision tool as much as anything. Structure of the poem, the meaning of the poem, the imagery of the poem, the language of the poem, and the effect of the poem on you, the reader. In any given answer, you, you wouldn't necessarily refer to all of these. There are videos out there that, you know, the, the structure of the essay is to go through each of these things. Well, that may not be necessary. The, the question could be talking um, about a method, the method the poet uses. It could be talking about the meaning of the poem. It could be talking about the effect of the poem. Um, it's up to you to decide which ones you... Um, will talk about you haven't got that much time so just remember this as a good revision tool structure of the poem the meaning of the poem the imagery the language and the effect so Ted Hughes's Hawk Roosting is um, a uh, really a, a dramatic monologue from the point of view of a hawk as imagined by Ted Hughes who um, I think at the time of writing this poem, lived on a farm in the countryside and spent a lot of his time walking around and looking at animals, anthropomorphising them, giving them human qualities and, and trying to work out the, the way in which their, their consciousness, their brain works, imagining. And he does it very effectively here. Now, in terms of meaning, the, the obvious conflict... Um, with, within the poem is that the hawk um, kills um, the conflict for you is to decide how much of a metaphor this poem is and Ted Hughes himself claims that everybody misinterprets this poem and tries to tries to broaden it out to be a representation of dictators and tyrants when in fact he was merely looking at a hawk and, and trying to work out the way in which um, it operates within the grand scheme of the universe. However, from a poetry point of view, from this exam, you have to apply the metaphor to it on one level. But the conflict is that conflict between nature in this poem, the hawk, and its relationship with the rest of nature, the earth, the other animals. Now, the hawk in this poem is boastful, arrogant, um, and rightly so, it knows it is superior. It sits at the top of the tree, almost literally. Um, a hawk roosting is um, a hawk who has done its feeding for the day and has gone back to its tree, to its nest or whatever, and in Ted Hughes' eyes, reflecting on what it's done that day and knowing it will do the same the next day. And nothing really will stop it. It is at the top of the food chain. It isn't just the hawk that's <clears throat> um, given qualities here, personified. The earth is personified, but the earth's personified in a, an interesting way. Because we're looking at it from the hawk's arrogant, self-confident point of view, the earth is personified as a servant of the hawk. It's personified as um, being at the hawk's disposal which is the ultimate form of arrogance because, you know, without the earth, obviously, um, nature doesn't exist, including the hawk. So it's illogical, but it demonstrates the false position of the hawk in the grand scheme of things. But it's not the hawk's fault. The hawk is well aware. The hawk is just existing as it ought to, and that is to uh, prey on other things. Now, it's easy, again, to see how this can be used metaphorically to represent dictators and people who have ultimate authority over people and can whimsically take lives because they operate in that same arrogant bubble, thinking that they are separate from the rest of the world. The, the rules don't apply. So it's easy to do that. So from a meaning point of view, we have this boastful hawk who... Um, rightly or wrongly, but in a, from a natural point of view, believes that 
he is superior and that everything works for his or her benefit. So the language, it's from uh, the uh, Hawke's point of view. Um, it's self-centred in that sense, that it's um, <coughs> personal, the pronouns all point in that direction. Um, it's unequivocal in that sense, that there's no ambiguity, there's no discussion. This is not Ted Hughes reflecting on the nature of, ho of the hawk. This is Ted Hughes anthropomorphising the hawk. It's, it's far more emotive because of that. And the language he uses to illustrate that is incredibly violent. <clears throat> and it's violent in the sense that ultimately things die, but if, if we just look at some of the words, um, just the nature of some of the words, hooked, hooked, um, perfect kills, it's quite harsh, the sounds are quite harsh, the consonants are harsh. Um, and we get this uh, further on, uh, rough bark, locked, um, uh, let's find some more, if we look down here we then have this brilliant sort of oxymoronic metaphor of the allotment of death, the idea that everything that grows is grown for his consumption or her consumption. Um, we associate allotments with generating um, food, giving things life so that it grows and then it, gives, it feeds us. So it, it's not that far-fetched, you know, we, we, we grow things to eat. The hawk is saying the same thing, the allotment of death. For the one path of my flight is direct, which again is very sort of harsh, lang um, harsh sounds, through the bones of the living, no arguments. So this is the, this is the arrogance, this is where we see the, um, the hawk's uh, complete self-assertion that, that nothing nothing can get in its way. No arguments assert my right. There is nothing to counter his assertion. Nothing's coming along to slap him about. The sun is behind me. There's a double meaning here, the sun. You know, if you're going to go hunting as a hawk, you want the sun behind you so that the thing you're going to kill doesn't see you. And it also suggests that the sun, that nature supports his actions, that what he is doing is correct. And if we apply that to humanity, it, it suggests that the actions of tyrants, of dictators, of leaders, they have a moral superiority. They, they assume what they're doing is right because of their position within society. So the sun is behind me. Nothing has changed since I began. My eye has permitted no change. I am going to keep things like this. It's a, a brilliant last stanza because it just, it's the arrogance of these lines um, cannot be underemphasized. That everything here uh, demonstrates the prowess, the the superiority. Nothing has changed. My high eye has permitted no change. I'm going to keep things like this. It suits him. It's self-serving. You know, why would you... If things are going well for you, why would you want to change? Um, it's a sort of capitalist view of the world, um, of the survival of the fittest, and this... the, the state of being, which is that um, every, every man for themselves. Uh, that's not to say um, that Ted Hughes is in any way making a political point here. He probably wasn't. So if we look at the, the form of the poem, it's in quatrains, um, which um, lines of uh, stanzas of four. And we have um, the odd couplet, feet, eat. Um, there's, there's, there's not much to go on there. I wouldn't really want to waste any time talking too much about that but the term, in terms of the structure that's very sorry the form is important they are in uniform uh, quatrains which suggests order it suggests that the world in which this hawk lives has order it reflects the fact that 
nature is ordered, that things happen because they ought to happen. So from a, a nature point of view, uh, the quatrains support that. They work brilliantly. If we you apply this as a metaphor to society or to some weird tyrant, then this would be the order of, of this form would be within their head. They would believe that what they're doing is correct, normal, um, that it, they are just following um, a routine. You know, shooting somebody in the head off a bal- from a balcony in a, a concentration camp. That would not be abnormal to them. That's just, that's a routine, that's a structure, that's target practice. To the rest of the world, uh, there's, a, there's a real kind of um, problem with that. That is completely against the natural order of things. And the, uh, but let's go back to the hawk. For the hawk, this is nature, this is normal. The form supports that. In terms of the structure, what this poem does structurally is just continually demonstrate the self confidence of this hawk. There isn't really a central turning point, if you like. It starts with I sit at the top of the wood and it finishes with I'm going to keep things like this. Um, we have just a repetition of its, of its superiority, the convenience of high trees. Yeah, they've risen to the top, naturally. Um, and then a brilliant line. And the earth's face upward for my inspection. This is where we get the idea that the earth is subservient to the hawk, which is just the most arrogant way of looking at things. It's like a company boss looking at the people who work for him um, and not appreciating what they do keeps him in a job. He just thinks, I'm keeping you in a job, get working. But it's a symbiotic relationship in reality. But in this form of state of arrogance, they, the, the hawk doesn't see it like that. The, the, the earth simply does um, what the hawk needs it to do, which is to provide food. I kill where I please because it is all mine. Well, that's an incredibly powerful uh, line, sentence. I kill where I please because it is all mine. It is the voice of a tyrant. It's the voice of a nutter. Um, but actually, for a hawk, it's not a tyrant or a nutter. It needs to eat. It's a fact. So there are two ways of looking at this. The, the, the na- the, 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 from the point of view of nature which is what Ted Hughes uh, intended, and then metaphorically the point of view of humanity. From a conflict point of view, the important thing to remember is is here that the conflict um, for the hawk is quite simple and straightforward. Um, The conflict really is for us to understand that there is this relationship between two things, nature, the earth, and the hawk, and that... Some, some things are weak and some things are strong. And in a sense, that's just tough luck. That's life. 